The Last Lords of Gerdinal by William Gilbert First published in the Argosy in 1867 One of the most picturesque objects in the valley of the Engadine is the ruined castle of Gerdinal, near the village of Madeline. In the feudal times it was the seat of a family of barons, who possessed as their patrimony the whole of the valley which with the castle had descended from father to son for many generations the last two of the race were brothers handsome well-made fine-looking young men but in nature they more resembled fiends than human beings so cruel rapacious and tyrannical were they during the earlier part of his life their father had been careful of his patrimony he had also been unusually just to the serfs on his estates and in consequence they had attained to such a condition of comfort and prosperity as was rarely met with among those in the power of the feudal lords of the country most of whom were arbitrary and exacting in the extreme for several years in the latter part of his life he had been subject to a severe illness which had confined him to the castle and the management of his possessions and the government of his serfs had thus fallen into the hands of his sons although the old baron had placed so much power in their hands still he was far from resigning his own authority he exacted a strict account from them of the manner in which they performed the different duties he had entrusted to them and having a strong suspicion of their character and the probability of their endeavouring to conceal their misdoings he caused agents to watch them secretly and to report to him as to the correctness of the statements they gave these agents possibly knowing that the old man had but a short time to live invariably gave a most favourable description of the conduct of the two young nobles which it must be admitted was not during their father's lifetime particularly reprehensible on the whole still they frequently showed as much of the cloven foot as to prove to the tenants what they had to expect at no distant day at the old baron's death conrad the elder inherited as his portion the castle of gerdinal and the whole valley of engadine while to hermann the younger was assigned some immense estates belonging to his father in the bresciano district for even in those early days there was considerable intercourse between the inhabitants of that northern portion of italy and those of the valley of the engadine the old baron had also willed that should either of his sons die without children his estates should go to the survivor conrad accordingly now took possession of the castle and its territory and hermann of the estates on the southern side of the alps which although much smaller than those left to his elder brother were still of great value notwithstanding the disparity in the worth of the legacies bequeathed to the two brothers a perfectly good feeling existed between them which promised to continue their tastes being the same while the mountains which divided them tended to the continuance of peace conrad had hardly been one single week feudal lord of the engadine before the inhabitants found to their sorrow how great was the difference between him and the old baron instead of the score of armed retainers his father had kept conrad increased the number to three hundred men none of whom were natives of the valley they had been chosen with great care from a body of bohemian german and italian outlaws who at that time infested the borders of the grison or had found refuge in the fastnesses of the mountains men capable of any atrocity and to whom pity was unknown from these miscreants the baron especially chose for his bodyguard those who were ignorant of the language spoken by the peasantry of the engadine as they would be less likely to be influenced by any supplications or excuses which might be made to them when in the performance of their duty although the keeping of so numerous a body of armed retainers might naturally be considered to have entailed great expense such a conclusion would be most erroneous at least as far as regarded the present baron who was as avaricious as he was despotic 
he contrived to support his soldiers by imposing a most onerous tax on his tenants irrespective of his ordinary feudal imposts and woe to the unfortunate villagers who from inability or from a sense of the injustice inflicted on them did not contribute to the uttermost farthing the amount levied on them in such a case a party of soldiers was immediately sent off to the defaulting village to collect the tax with permission to live at free quarters till the money was paid and they knew their duty too well to return home till they had succeeded in their errand in doing this they were frequently merciless in the extreme exacting the money by torture or any other means they pleased and when they had been successful in obtaining the baron's dues by way of further punishment they generally robbed the poor peasantry of everything they had which was worth the trouble of carrying away and not unfrequently from a spirit of sheer mischief they spoiled all that remained many were the complaints which reached the ears of the baron of the cruel behaviour of his retainers but in no case did they receive any redress the baron making it a portion of his policy that no crimes committed by those under his command should be investigated so long as those crimes took place when employed in collecting taxes which he had imposed and which had remained unpaid but the depredations and cruelties of the baron conrad were not confined solely to the valley of the engadine frequently in the summer time when the snows had melted on the mountains so as to make the road practicable for his soldiers and their plunder he would make a raid on the italian side of the alps there they would rob and commit every sort of atrocity with impunity and when they had collected sufficient booty they returned with it to the castle loud indeed were the complaints which reached the authorities of milan with routine tardiness the government never took any energetic steps to punish the offenders until the winter had set in and to cross the mountains in that season would have been almost an impossibility at all events for an army when the spring returned more prudential reasons prevailed and the matter gradually diminishing in interest was at last allowed to die out without any active measures being taken again the districts in which these atrocities had been committed were hardly looked upon by the milanese government as being italian the people themselves were beginning to be infected by a heresy which approached closely to the protestantism of the present day nor was their language that of italy but a patois of their own thus the government began to consider it unadvisable to attempt to punish the baron richly as he deserved it on behalf of those who after all were little worthy of the protection they demanded the only real step they took to chastise him was to get him excommunicated by the pope which as the baron and his followers professed no religion at all was treated by them with ridicule it happened that in one of his marauding expeditions in the volklina the baron when near bormio saw a young girl of extraordinary beauty he was only attended at the time by two followers else it is more than probable he would have made her a prisoner and carried her off to gerdinal as it was he would probably have made the attempt had she not been surrounded by a number of peasants who were working in some fields belonging to her father the baron was also aware that the militia of the town who had been expecting his visit were under arms and on an alarm being given could be on the spot in a few minutes now as the baron combined his despotism with a considerable amount of cunning he merely attempted to enter into conversation with the girl finding his advances coldly received he contented himself with inquiring of one of the peasants the girl's name and place of abode he received for reply that her name was teresa beefy and that she was the daughter of a substantial farmer who with his wife and four children of whom teresa was the eldest lived in a house at the extremity of the land he occupied as soon as the baron had received this information he left the spot 
and proceeded to the farmer's house which he inspected externally with great care he found it was of considerable size strongly built of stone with iron bars to the lower windows and a strong well-made oaken door which could be securely fastened from the inside after having made the round of the house which he did alone he returned to his two men whom in order to avoid suspicion he had placed at a short distance from the building in a spot where they could not easily be seen ludovico he said to one of them who was his lieutenant and invariably accompanied him in all his expeditions mark well that house for some day or more probably night you may have to pay it a visit ludovico merely said in reply that he would be always ready and willing to perform any order his master might honour him with and the baron with his men then left the spot the hold the beauty of teresa beefy had taken upon the imagination of the baron actually looked like enchantment his love for her instead of diminishing by time seemed to increase daily at last he resolved on making her his wife and about a month after he had seen her he commissioned his lieutenant ludovico to carry to beefy an offer of marriage with his daughter not dreaming at the moment of the possibility of a refusal ludovico immediately started on his mission and in due time arrived at the farmer's house and delivered the baron's message to ludovico's intense surprise however he received from beefy a positive refusal not daring to take back so uncourteous a reply to his master ludovico went on to describe the great advantage which would accrue to the farmer and his family if the baron's proposal were accepted not only he said would teresa be a lady of the highest rank and in possession of enormous wealth both in gold and jewels but that the other members of her family would also be ennobled and each of them as they grew up would receive appointments under the baron besides having large estates allotted to them in the engadine valley the farmer listened with patience to ludovico and when he had concluded he replied tell your master i have received his message and that i am ready to admit that great personal advantages might accrue to me and my family by accepting his offer say that although i am neither noble nor rich that yet at the same time i am not poor but were i as poor as the blind mendicant whom you passed on the road in coming hither i would spurn such an offer from so infamous a wretch as the baron you say truly that he is well known for his power and his wealth but the latter has been obtained by robbing both rich and poor who had not the means to resist him and his power has been greatly strengthened by engaging in his service a numerous band of robbers and cutthroats who are ready and willing to murder any one at his bidding you have my answer and the sooner you quit this neighbourhood the better for i can assure you that any one known to be in the service of the baron conrad is likely to meet with a most unfavourable reception from those who live around us then you positively refuse his offer said ludovico positively and without the slightest reservation was the farmer's reply and you wish me to give him the message in the terms you have made use of without omitting a word was the farmer's reply at the same time you may add to it as many of the same description as you please take care said ludovico there is yet time for you to reconsider your decision if you insist on my taking your message to the baron i must of course do so but in that case make your peace with heaven as soon as you can for the baron is not a man to let such an insult pass follow my advice and accept his offer ere it is too late i have no other answer to give you said beefy i am sorry for it said ludovico heaving a deep sigh i have now no alternative and mounting his horse he rode away now it must not be imagined 
that the advice ludovico gave the farmer and the urgent requests and arguments he offered were altogether the genuine effusions of his heart on the contrary ludovico had easily perceived on hearing the farmer's first refusal that there was no chance of the proposal being accepted he had therefore occupied his time during the remaining portion of the interview in carefully examining the premises and mentally taking note of the manner in which they could be most easily entered as he judged rightly enough that before long he might be sent to the house on a far less peaceable mission nothing could exceed the rage of the baron when he heard the farmer's message you cowardly villain he said to ludovico did you allow the wretch to live who could send such a message to your master so please you said ludovico what could i do you could have struck him to the heart with your dagger could you not said the baron i have known you to do such a thing to an old woman for half the provocation had it been beefy's wife instead you might have shown more courage had i followed my own inclination said ludovico i would have killed the fellow on the spot but then i could not have brought away the young lady with me for there were too many persons about the house and in the fields at the time so i thought before acting further i had better let you hear his answer one favour i hope your excellency will grant me that if the fellow is to be punished you will allow me to inflict it as a reward for the skill i showed in keeping my temper when i heard the message <sighs> perhaps you have acted wisely ludovico said the baron after a few moments silence at present my mind is too much ruffled by the villain's impertinence to think calmly on the subject to-morrow we will speak of it again next day the baron sent for his lieutenant and said to him ludovico i have now a commission for you to execute which i think will be exactly to your taste take with you six men whom you can trust and start this afternoon for bormio sleep at some village on the road but let not one word escape you as to your errand to-morrow morning leave the village but separately so that you may not be seen together as it is better to avoid suspicion meet again near the farmer's house and arrive there if possible before evening has set in for in all probability you will have to make an attack upon the house and you may thus become well acquainted with the locality before doing so but keep yourselves concealed otherwise you will spoil all after you have done this retire some distance and remain concealed until midnight as then all the family will be in their first sleep and you will experience less difficulty than if you began later i particularly wish you to enter the house without using force but if you cannot do so break into it in any way you consider best bring out the girl and do her no harm if any resistance is made by her father kill him but not unless you are compelled as i do not wish to enrage his daughter against me however let nothing prevent you from securing her burn the house down or anything you please but bring her here if you execute your mission promptly and to my satisfaction i promise you and those with you a most liberal reward now go and get ready to depart as speedily as you can ludovico promised to execute the baron's mission to the letter and shortly afterwards left the castle accompanied by six of the greatest ruffians he could find among the men-at-arms although on the spur of the moment beefy had sent so defiant a message to the baron he afterwards felt considerable uneasiness as to the manner in which it would be received he did not repent having refused the proposal but he knew that the baron was a man of the most cruel and vindictive disposition and would in all probability seek some means to be avenged the only defence he could adopt was to make the fastenings of his house as secure as possible and to keep at least one of his labourers about him whom he could send as a messenger to bormio for assistance and to arouse the inhabitants in the immediate vicinity in case of his being attacked without any hesitation 
all promised to aid beefy in every way in their power for he had acquired great renown among the inhabitants of the place for the courage he had shown in refusing so indignantly the baron's offer of marriage for his daughter about midnight on the day after ludovico's departure from the castle beefy was aroused by some one knocking at the door of his house and demanding admission it was ludovico for after attempting in vain to enter the house secretly he had concealed his men determining to try the effect of treachery before using force on the inquiry being made as to who the stranger was he replied that he was a poor traveller who had lost his way and begged that he might be allowed a night's lodging as he was so weary he could not go a step further i am sorry for you said beefy but i cannot allow you to enter this house before daylight as the night is fine and warm you can easily sleep on the straw under the windows and in the morning i will let you in and give you a good breakfast again and again did ludovico plead to be admitted but in vain beefy would not be moved from his resolution at last however the bravo's patience got exhausted and suddenly changing his manner he roared out in a threatening tone if you don't let me in you villain i will burn your house over your head i have here as you may see plenty of men to help me put my threat into execution he continued pointing to the men who had now come up so you had better let me in at once in a moment beefy comprehended the character of the person he had to deal with so instead of returning any answer he retired from the window and alarmed the inmates of the house he also told the labourer whom he had engaged to sleep there to drop from a window at the back and run as fast as he could to arouse the inhabitants in the vicinity and tell them that his house was attacked by the baron and his men he was to beg them to arm themselves and come to his aid as quickly as possible and having done this he was to go on to Bormio on the same errand the poor fellow attempted to carry out his master's orders but in dropping from the window he fell with such force on the ground that he could only move with difficulty and in trying to crawl away he was observed by some of the baron's men who immediately set on him and killed him ludovico finding that he could not enter the house either secretly or by threatenings attempted to force open the door but it was so firmly barricaded from within that he did not succeed while in the meantime beefy and his family employed themselves in placing wooden faggots and heavy articles of furniture against it thus making it stronger than ever ludovico finding he could not gain an entrance by the door told his men to look around in search of a ladder so that they might get to the windows on the first floor as those on the ground floor were all small high up and well barricaded as was common in italian houses of the time but in spite of their efforts no ladder could be found he now deliberated what step he should next take as it was getting late he saw that if they did not succeed in effecting an entrance quickly the dawn would break upon them and the labourers going to their work would raise an alarm at last one man suggested that as abundance of fuel could be obtained from the stacks at the back of the house they might place a quantity of it against the door and set fire to it adding that the sight of the flames would soon make the occupants glad to effect their escape by the first floor windows the suggestion was no sooner made than acted upon a quantity of dry fuel was piled up against the house door to the height of many feet and a light having been procured by striking a flint stone against the hilt of a sword over some dried leaves fire was set to the pile from the dry nature of the fuel the whole mass was in a blaze in a few moments but the scheme did not have the effect ludovico had anticipated true the family rushed towards the windows in the front of the house but when they saw the flames rising so fiercely 
they retreated in the utmost alarm meanwhile the screams from the women and children who had now lost all self-control mingled with the roar of the blazing element which besides having set fire to the faggots and furniture placed within the door had now reached a quantity of fodder and indian corn stored on the ground floor ludovico soon perceived that the whole house was in flames and that the case was becoming desperate not only was there the danger of the fire alarming the inhabitants in the vicinity by the light it shed around but he also reflected what would be the rage of his master if the girl should perish in the flames and the consequent punishment which would be inflicted on him and those under his command if he returned empty-handed he now called out to beefy and his family to throw themselves out of the window and that he and his men would save them it was some time before he was understood but at last beefy brought the two younger children to the window and lowering them as far as he could he let them fall into the arms of ludovico and his men and they reached the ground in safety beefy now returned for the others and saw teresa standing at a short distance behind him he took her by the hand to bring her forward and they had nearly reached the window when she heard a scream from her mother who being an incurable invalid was confined to her bed without a moment's hesitation the girl turned back to assist her and the men below who thought that the prey they wanted was all but in their hands and cared little about the fate of the rest of the family were thus disappointed ludovico now anxiously awaited the reappearance of teresa but he waited in vain the flames had gained entire mastery and even the roof had taken fire the screams of the inmates were now no longer heard for if not stifled in the smoke they were lost in the roar of the fire whilst the glare which arose from it illumined the landscape far and near it so happened that a peasant who resided about a quarter of a mile from beefy's house had to go a long distance to his work and having risen at an unusually early hour he saw the flames and aroused the inmates of the other cottages in the village who immediately armed themselves and started off to the scene of the disaster imagining but too certainly that it was the work of an incendiary the alarm was also communicated to another village and from thence to bormio and in a short time a strong band of armed men had collected and proceeded together to assist in extinguishing the flames on their arrival at the house they found the place one immense heap of ashes not a soul was to be seen for ludovico and his men had already decamped the dawn now broke and the assembled peasantry made some attempt to account for the fire at first they were induced to attribute it to accident but on searching around they found the dead body of the murdered peasant and afterwards the two children who had escaped and who in their terror had rushed into a thick copse to conceal themselves with great difficulty they gathered from them sufficient to show that the fire had been caused by a band of robbers who had come for the purpose of plundering the house and their suspicion fell immediately on baron conrad without any better proof than his infamous reputation as soon as ludovico found that an alarm had been given he and his men started off to find their horses which they had hidden among some trees about a mile distant from beefy's house the daylight was just breaking and objects around them began to be visible but not so clearly as to allow them to see for any distance suddenly one of the men pointed to an indistinct figure in white some little way in advance of them ludovico halted for a moment to see what it might be and with his men watched it attentively as it appeared to fly from them it is the young girl herself said one of the men she has escaped from the fire and that was exactly as she appeared in her white dress with her father at the window i saw her well and am sure i am not mistaken it is indeed the girl 
said another. I also saw her. I hope you are right, said Ludovico, and if so, it will be fortunate indeed, for should we return without her, we may receive but a rude reception from the baron. They now quickened their pace, but, fast as they walked, the figure in white walked quite as rapidly. Ludovico, who of course began to suspect that it was Teresa attempting to escape from them, commanded his men to run as fast as they could in order to reach her. Although they tried their utmost, the figure, however, still kept the same distance before them. Another singularity about it was, that as daylight advanced, the figure appeared to become less distinct, and, ere they had reached their horses, it seemed to have melted away. Before mounting their horses, Ludovico held a consultation with his men as to what course they had better adopt, whether they should depart at once or search the neighbourhood for the girl. Both suggestions seemed to be attended with danger. If they delayed their departure, they might be attacked by the peasantry, who by this time were doubtless in hot pursuit of them, and if they returned to the baron without Teresa, they were almost certain to receive a severe punishment for failing in their enterprise. At last, the idea struck Ludovico that a good round lie might possibly succeed with the baron and do something to avert his anger, while there was little hope of its in the slightest manner availing with the enraged peasantry. He therefore gave the order for his men to mount their horses, resolving to tell the baron that Teresa had escaped from the flames, and had begged their assistance, but that a number of armed inhabitants of Bormio, chancing to approach, she had sought their protection. A great portion of this statement could be substantiated by his men, as they still fully believed that the figure in white which they had so indistinctly seen was the girl herself. Ludovico and his men, during their homeward journey, had great difficulty in crossing the mountains, in consequence of a heavy fall of snow, for it was now late in the autumn. Next day, they arrived at the castle of Gerdenal. It would be difficult to describe the rage of the baron when he heard that his retainers had been unsuccessful in their mission. He ordered Ludovico to be thrown into a dungeon, where he remained for more than a month, and was only then liberated in consequence of the baron needing his services, for some expedition requiring special skill and courage. The other men were also punished, though less severely than their leader, on whom, of course, they laid all the blame. For some time after Ludovico's return, the baron occupied himself in concocting schemes, not only to secure the girl Teresa, for he fully believed the account Ludovico had given of her escape, but to revenge himself on the inhabitants of Bormio for the part they had taken in the affair, and it was to carry out these schemes that he liberated Ludovico from prison. The winter had passed, and the spring sun was rapidly melting the snows on the mountains, when one morning three travel-stained men, having the appearance of respectable burghers, arrived at the hospice, and requested to be allowed an interview with the innominato. A messenger was dispatched to the castle, who shortly afterwards returned, saying that his master desired the visitors should immediately be admitted into his presence. When they arrived at the castle they found him fully prepared to receive them, a handsome repast being spread out for their refreshment. At first the travellers seemed under some restraint, but this was soon dispelled by the friendly courtesy of the astrologer. After partaking of the viands which had been set before them, the innominato inquired the object of their visit. One of them, who had been evidently chosen as spokesman, then rose from his chair and addressed their host as follows. We have been sent to your excellency by the inhabitants of Bormio, as a deputation, to ask your advice and assistance in a strait we are in at present. Late in the autumn of last year, the Baron Conrad, feudal lord of the Engadine, 
was on some not very honest expedition in our neighbourhood when by chance he saw a very beautiful girl of the name of teresa beefy whose father occupied a large farm about half a league from the town the baron it appears became so deeply enamoured of the girl that he afterwards sent a messenger to her father with an offer of marriage for his daughter beefy knowing full well the infamous reputation of the baron unhesitatingly declined his proposal and in such indignant terms as to arouse the tyrant's anger to the highest pitch determining not only to possess himself of the girl but to avenge the insult he had received he sent a body of armed retainers who in the night attacked the farmer's house and endeavoured to effect an entrance by breaking open the door finding they could not succeed and after murdering one of the servants who had been sent to a neighbouring village to give the alarm they set fire to the house and with the exception of two children who contrived to escape the whole family including the young girl herself perished in the flames it appears however that the baron doubtless through his agents received a false report that the young girl had escaped and was taken under the protection of some of the inhabitants of Bormio. In consequence, he sent another body of armed men, who arrived in the night at the house of the Podesta, and contrived to make his only son, a boy of about fifteen years old, a prisoner, bearing him off to the baron's castle. They left word that unless Teresa Bifi was placed in their power before the first day of May, not only would the youth be put to death but the baron would also wreak vengeance on the whole town on the perpetration of this last atrocity we again applied to the government of milan for protection but although our reception was most courteous and we were promised assistance we have too good reason to doubt our receiving it certainly up to the present time no steps have been taken in the matter nor has a single soldier been sent although the time named for the death of the child has nearly expired the townsmen therefore having heard of your great wisdom and power your willingness to help those who are in distress as well as to protect the weak and oppressed have sent us to ask you to take them under your protection as the baron is not a man to scruple at putting such a threat into execution the innominato who had listened to the delicate with great patience and attention told him that he had no soldiers or retainers at his orders while the baron whose wicked life was known to him had many but your excellency has great wisdom and from all we have heard we feel certain that you could protect us your case said the innominato is a very sad one i admit and you certainly ought to be protected from the baron's machinations i will not disguise from you that i have the power to help you tell the unhappy podesta that he need be under no alarm as to his son's safety and that i will oblige the baron to please him my art tells me that the boy is still alive though confined in prison as for your friends who sent you to me tell them that the baron shall do them no harm all you have to do is to contrive some means by which the baron may hear that the girl teresa beefy has been placed by me where he will never find her without my permission but teresa beefy said the delicate perished with her father and the baron will wreak his vengeance both on you and us when he finds you cannot place the girl in his power fear nothing but obey my orders said the innominato do what i have told you and i promise you shall have nothing to dread from him the sooner you carry out my directions the better the deputation now returned to bormio and related all that had taken place at their interview with the innominato although the result of their mission was scarcely considered satisfactory they determined after much consideration to act on the astrologer's advice 
but how to carry it out was a very difficult matter this was however overcome by one of the chief inhabitants of the town a man of most determined courage offering himself as a delegate to the baron to convey to him the anominato's message without hesitation the offer was gratefully accepted and the next day he started on his journey no sooner had he arrived at the castle of gerdinand and explained the object of his mission than he was ushered into the presence of the baron whom he found in the great hall surrounded by a numerous body of armed men well said the baron as soon as the delegate had entered have your townspeople come to their senses at last and sent me the girl teresa no they have not baron was the reply for she is not in their custody all they can do is to inform you where you may possibly receive some information about her and where may that be the only person who knows where she may be found is the celebrated astrologer who lives in a castle near Laco. ah now you are trifling with me said the baron sternly you must be a great fool or a very bold man to try such an experiment as that i am neither the one nor the other your excellency nor am i trifling with you what i have told you is the simple truth and how did you learn it from the anominato's own lips then you applied to him for assistance against me said the baron furiously that is hardly correct your excellency said the delegate it is true we applied to him for advice as to the manner in which we should act in case you should attack us and put your threat into execution respecting the son of the podesta and what answer did he give you just what i have told you that he alone knows where teresa beefy is to be found and that you could not remove her from the protection she is under without his permission did he send that message to me in defiance said the baron i have no reason to believe so your excellency the baron was silent for some time he then inquired of the delegate how many armed retainers the anominato kept none i believe was the reply at any rate there were none to be seen when the deputation from the town visited him the baron was again silent for some moments and seemed deeply absorbed in thought he would rather have met with any other opponent than the anominato whose reputation was well known to him and whose learning he dreaded more than the power of any nobleman no matter how many armed retainers he could bring against him i very much suspect he said at last that some deception is being practised on me but should my suspicion be correct i shall exact terrible vengeance i shall detain you he continued turning abruptly and fiercely on the delegate as a hostage while i visit the anominato and if i do not succeed with him you shall die on the same scaffold as the son of your podesta it was in vain that the delegate protested against being detained as a prisoner saying that it was against all rules of knightly usage but the baron would not listen to reason and the unfortunate man was immediately hurried out of the hall and imprisoned although the baron by no means liked the idea of an interview with the anominato he immediately made preparations to visit him and the day after the delegate's arrival he set out on his journey attended by only four of his retainers it should here be mentioned that it is more than probable the baron would have avoided meeting the anominato on any other occasion whatever so great was the dislike he had to him he seemed to be acting under some fatality some power seemed to impel him in his endeavours to obtain teresa which it was impossible to account for the road chosen by the baron to reach the castle of the anominato was rather a circuitous one in the first place he did not consider it prudent to pass through the Faltlina. in the second he thought that by visiting his brother on his way he might be able to obtain some particulars as to the character of the mysterious individual 
whom he was about to see as his reputation would probably be better known among the inhabitants of the bergamo district than by those in the valley of the engadine the baron arrived safely at his brother's castle where the reports which had hitherto indistinctly reached him of the wonderful power and skill of the astrologer were fully confirmed after remaining a day with his brother the baron started for leco under an assumed name he stayed here for two days in order that he might receive the report of one of his men whom he had sent forward to ascertain whether the innominato had any armed men in his castle for being capable of any act of treachery himself he naturally suspected treason in others the man in due time returned and reported that although he had taken great pains to find out the truth he was fully convinced that not only were there no soldiers in the castle but that it did not to the best of his belief contain an arm of any kind the innominato relying solely on his occult power for his defence perfectly assured that he had no danger to apprehend the baron left leco attended by his retainers and in a few hours afterwards he arrived at the hospice where his wish for an interview was conveyed to the astrologer after some delay a reply was sent that the innominato was willing to receive the baron on condition that he came alone as his retainers would not be allowed to enter the castle the baron hesitated for some moments not liking to place himself in the power of a man who after all might prove a very dangerous adversary and who might even use treacherous means his love for teresa beefy however urged him to accept the invitation and he accompanied the messenger to the castle the innominato received his guest with stern courtesy and without even asking him to be seated requested to know the object of his visit perhaps i am not altogether unknown to you said the baron i am lord of the engadine frankly said the innominato your name and reputation are both well known to me it would give me great satisfaction were they less so i regret to hear you speak in that tone said the baron evidently making great efforts to repress his rising passion a person in my position is not likely to be without enemies but it rather surprises me to find a man of your reputation so prejudiced against me without having investigated the accusations laid to my charge you judge wrongly if you imagine that i am so said the innominato but once more will you tell me the object of your visit i understood said the baron by a message sent to me by the insolent inhabitants of Bormio, that you know the person with whom a young girl named Teresa Bifi is at present residing. Might I ask if that statement is correct? I hardly sent it in those words, said the innominato, but admitting it to be so, I must first ask your reason for inquiring. I have not the slightest objection to inform you, said the baron i have nothing to conceal i wish to make her my wife on those terms i am willing to assist you said the astrologer but only on the condition that you immediately release the messenger you have most unjustly confined in one of your dungeons as well as the young son of the podesta and that you grant them a safe escort back to Bormio, and further that you promise to cease annoying the people of that district do all this and i am willing to promise you that teresa beefy shall not only become your wife but shall bring with her a dowry and wedding outfit sufficiently magnificent even for the exalted position to which you propose to raise her i solemnly promise you said the baron that the moment the wedding is over the delegate from bormio and the son of the podesta shall both leave my castle perfectly free and unhampered with any conditions and moreover that i will send a strong escort with them to protect them on their road i see you are already meditating treachery 
said the innominato but i will not in any manner alter my offer the day week after their safe return to bormio teresa bifi shall arrive at the castle of gerdino for the wedding ceremony now you distinctly know my conditions and i demand from you an unequivocal acceptance or refusal what security shall i have that the bargain will be kept on your side said the baron my word and no other the baron remained silent for a moment and then said i accept your offer but clearly understand me in my turn sir astrologer fail to keep your promise and had you ten times the power you have i will take my revenge on you and i am not a man to threaten such a thing without doing it all that i am ready to allow said the innominato with great coolness that is to say in case you have the power to carry out your threat which in the present instance you have not do not imagine that because i am not surrounded by a band of armed cut-throats and miscreants i am not the stronger of the two you little dream how powerless you are in my hands you see this bird he continued taking down a common sparrow in a wooden cage from a nail in the wall on which it hung it is not more helpless in my hands than you are nay more i will now give the bird far greater power over you than i possess over it as he spoke he unfastened the door of the cage and the sparrow darted from it through the window into the air and in a moment afterwards was lost to sight that bird the astrologer went on to say will follow you till i deprive it of the power i bear you no malice for doubting my veracity falsehood is too much a portion of your nature for you to disbelieve its existence in others i will not seek to punish you for the treachery which i am perfectly sure you will soon be imagining against me without giving you fair warning for a traitor yourself you naturally suspect treason in others as soon as you entertain a thought of evading your promise to release your prisoners or conceive any treason or ill-feeling against me that sparrow will appear to you if you instantly abandon the thought no harm will follow but if you do not a terrible punishment will soon fall upon you in whatever position you may find yourself at the moment the bird will be near you and no skill of yours will be able to harm it the baron now left the innominato and returned with his men to leco where he employed himself for the remainder of the day in making preparations for his homeward journey to return by the circuitous route he had taken in going to leco would have occupied too much time as he was anxious to arrive at his castle that he might without delay release the prisoners and make preparations for his wedding with teresa bifi to pass the voltolina openly with his retainers which was by far the shortest road would have exposed him to too much danger he therefore resolved to divide his party and send three men back by his brother's castle so that they could return the horses they had borrowed then he would disguise himself and the fourth man a german who could not speak a word of italian and from whom he had nothing therefore to fear on the score of treachery as two tyrolese merchants returning to their own country he also purchased two mules and some provisions for the journey so that they need not be obliged to rest in any of the villages they passed through where possibly they might be detected and probably maltreated next morning the baron and his servant together with the two mules went on board a large bark which was manned by six men and which he had hired for the occasion and in it they started for colico at the commencement of their voyage they kept along the eastern side of the lake but after advancing a few miles the wind which had hitherto been moderate now became so strong as to cause much fatigue to the rowers and the captain of the bark determined on crossing the lake so as to be under the lee of the mountains on the other side 
when halfway across they came in view of the turrets of the castle of the Anominato. The sight of the castle brought to the baron's mind his interview with its owner, and the defiant manner in which he had been treated by him. The longer he gazed, the stronger became his anger against the Anominato, and at last it rose to such a point that he exclaimed aloud, to the great surprise of the men in the boat, some day i will meet thee again thou insolent villain and i will then take signal vengeance on thee for the insult offered me yesterday the words had hardly been uttered when a sparrow apparently driven from the shore by the wind settled on the bark for a moment and then flew away the baron instantly remembered what the anominato had said to him and also the warning the bird was to give with a sensation closely resembling fear, he tried to change the current of his thoughts, and was on the point of turning his head from the castle, when the rowers in the boat simultaneously set up a loud shout of warning, and the baron then perceived that a heavily laden vessel, four times the size of his own, and with a huge sail set, was running before the wind with great velocity, threatening the next moment to strike his boat on the beam, in which case both he and the men would undoubtedly be drowned fortunately the captain of the strange bark had heard the cry of the rowers and by rapidly putting down his helm saved their lives though the baron's boat was struck with so much violence on the quarter that she nearly sank the baron conrad had now received an earnest that the threat of the anominato was not a vain one and feeling that he was entirely in his power resolved if possible not to offend him again the boat continued on her voyage and late in the evening arrived safely at colico where the baron with his servant and the mules disembarked and without delay proceeded on their journey they continued on their road till nightfall when they began to consider how they should pass the night they looked around them but they could perceive no habitation or shelter of any kind and it was now raining heavily they continued their journey onwards and had almost come to the conclusion that they should be obliged to pass the night in the open air when a short distance before them they saw a low cottage the door of which was open showing the dim light of a fire burning within the baron now determined to ask the owner of the cottage for permission to remain there for the night but to be certain that no danger could arise he sent forward his man to discover whether it was a house standing by itself or one of a village as in the latter case he would have to use great caution to avoid being detected his servant accordingly left him to obey orders and shortly afterwards returned with the news that the house was a solitary one and that he could not distinguish a trace of any other in the neighbourhood satisfied with this information the baron proceeded to the cottage door and begged the inmates to afford him shelter for the night assuring them that the next morning he would remunerate them handsomely the peasant and his wife a sickly-looking emaciated old couple gladly offered them all the accommodation the wretched cabin could afford after fastening up the mules at the back of the house and bringing in the baggage and some dry fodder to form a bed for the baron and his servant they prepared some of the food their guests had brought with them for supper, and shortly afterwards the baron and his servant were fast asleep. Next morning they rose early and continued on their journey. After they had been some hours on the road, the baron, who had before been conversing with his retainer, suddenly became silent and absorbed in thought. He rode on a few paces in advance of the man, thinking over the conditions made by the anominato when the idea struck him whether it would not be possible in some way to evade them he had hardly entertained the thought when the sparrow flew rapidly before his mule's head and then instantly afterwards his servant who had ridden up to him touched him on the shoulder and pointed to a body of eight or ten armed men about a quarter of a mile distant who were advancing towards them the baron fearing lest they might be some of the armed inhabitants of the neighbourhood who were banded together against him and seeing that no time was to be lost immediately plunged with his servant into a thick copse where 
without being seen, he could command a view of the advancing soldiers as they passed. He perceived that when they came near the place where he was concealed, they halted, and evidently set about examining the traces of the footsteps of the mules. They communed together for some time, as if in doubt what course they should adopt, and finally, the leader giving the order, they continued their march onwards, and the baron shortly afterwards left his place of concealment. Nothing further worthy of notice occurred that day, and late at night they passed through Bormio, fortunately without being observed. They afterwards arrived safely at the foot of the mountain pass, and at dawn began the ascent. The day was fine and calm, and the sun shone magnificently. The baron, who now calculated that the dangers of his journey were over, was in high spirits and familiarly conversed with his retainer. When they had reached a considerable elevation, the path narrowed so that the two could not ride abreast, and the baron went in advance. He now became very silent and thoughtful, all his thoughts being fixed on the approaching wedding, and in speculations as to how short a time it would take for the delegate and the youth to reach Bormio. Suddenly the thought occurred to him whether the men whom he should send to escort the hostages back could not, when they had completed their business, remain concealed in the immediate neighbourhood till after the celebration of the wedding, and then bring back with them some other hostage, and thus enable him to make further demands for compensation for the insult he considered had been offered him. Although the idea had only been vaguely formed, and possibly with but little intention of carrying it out, he had an immediate proof that the power of the astrologer was following him. A sparrow settled on the ground before him, and did not move until his mule was close to it, when it rose in the air right before his face. He continued to follow its course with his eyes, and as it rose higher, he thought he perceived a tremulous movement in an immense mass of snow, which had accumulated at the base of one of the mountain peaks. All thought of treachery immediately vanished. He gave a cry of alarm to his servant, and they both hurried onwards, thus barely escaping being buried in an avalanche, which the moment afterwards overwhelmed the path they had crossed. The baron was now more convinced than ever of the tremendous power of the Innominato, and so great was his fear of him, that he resolved for the future not to contemplate any treachery against him, or entertain any thoughts of revenge. The day after the baron's arrival at the castle of Gerdinal, he ordered the delegate and the Podestar's son to be brought into his presence. Assuming a tone of much mildness and courtesy, he told them he much regretted the inconvenience they had been put to, but that the behaviour of the inhabitants of Bormio had left him no alternative. He was ready to admit that the delegate had told him the truth, although from the interview he had with the Innominato, he was by no means certain that the inhabitants of their town had acted in a friendly manner towards him, or were without blame in the matter. Still, he did not wish to be harsh, and was willing for the future to be on friendly terms with them, if they promised to cease insulting him. What possible affront they could have offered him, it would be difficult to say. At the same time, in justice to myself, he continued, his natural cupidity gaining the ascendant at the moment, I hardly think I ought to allow you to return without the payment of some fair ransom. He had scarcely uttered these words when a sparrow flew in at the window, and darting wildly two or three times across the hall, left by the same window through which it had entered. Those present who noticed the bird looked at it with an eye of indifference, but not so the baron. He knew perfectly well that it was a warning from the astrologer, and he looked around him to see what accident might have befallen him, had he continued the train of thought. Nothing of an extraordinary nature followed the disappearance of the bird. The baron now changed the conversation, and told his prisoners that they were at liberty to depart as soon as they pleased, and that, to prevent any misfortune befalling them on the road, he would send four of his retainers to protect them. 
in this he kept his promise to the letter and a few days afterwards the men returned reporting that the delegate and the son of the podesta had both arrived safely at their destination immediately after the departure of his prisoners the baron began to make preparations for his wedding for although he detested the innominato in his heart he had still the fullest reliance on his fulfilling the promise he had made his assurance was further confirmed by a messenger from the astrologer to inform him that on the next wednesday the affianced bride would arrive with her suite and that he the innominato had given this notice that all things might be in readiness for the ceremony neither expense nor exertion was spared by the baron to make his nuptials imposing and magnificent the chapel belonging to the castle which had been allowed to fall into a most neglected condition was put into order the altar redecorated and the walls hung with tapestry preparations were made in the inner hall for a banquet on the grandest scale which was to be given after the ceremony and on a dais in the main hall into which the bride was to be conducted on her arrival were placed two chairs of state where the baron and his bride were to be seated when the day arrived for the wedding everything was prepared for the reception of the bride as no hour had been named for her arrival all persons who were to be engaged in the ceremony were ready in the castle by break of day and the baron in a state of great excitement mounted to the top of the watch-tower that he might be able to give orders to the rest the moment her cavalcade appeared in sight hour after hour passed but still teresa did not make her appearance and at last the baron began to feel considerable anxiety on the subject at last a mist which had been over a part of the valley cleared up and all the anxiety of the baron was dispelled for in the distance he perceived a group of travellers approaching the castle some mounted on horseback and some on foot in front rode the bride on a superb white palfrey her face covered with a thick veil on each side of her rode an esquire magnificently dressed behind her were a waiting woman on horseback and two men servants and in the rear were several led mules laden with packages the baron now quitted his position in the tower and descended to the castle gates to receive his bride when he arrived there he found one of the esquires who had ridden forward at the desire of his mistress waiting to speak to him i have been ordered he said to the baron by the lady teresa to request that you will be good enough to allow her to change her dress before she meets you the baron of course willingly assented and then retired into the hall destined for the reception ceremony shortly afterwards teresa arrived at the castle and being helped from her palfrey she proceeded with her lady-in-waiting and a female attendant who had been engaged by the baron into her private apartment while two of the muleteers brought up a large trunk containing her wedding dress in less than an hour teresa left her room to be introduced to the baron and was conducted into his presence by one of the esquires as soon as she entered the hall a cry of admiration arose from all present so extraordinary was her beauty the baron in a state of breathless emotion advanced to meet her but before he had reached her she bent on her knee and remained in that position till he had raised her up kneel not to me thou lovely one he said it is for all present to kneel to thee in adoration of thy wonderful beauty rather than for thee to bend to any one so saying and holding her hand he led her to one of the seats on the dais and then seating himself by her side gave orders for the ceremony of introduction to begin one by one the different persons to be presented were led up to her all of whom she received with a grace and amiability which raised her very high in their estimation when the ceremony of introduction was over the baron ordered that the procession should be formed and then 
taking teresa by the hand he led her into the chapel followed by the others when all were arranged in their proper places the marriage ceremony was performed by the priest and the newly married couple with the retainers and guests entered into the banqueting hall splendid as was the repast which had been prepared for the company their attention seemed for some time more drawn to the baron and his bride than to the duties of the feast a handsomer couple it would have been impossible to find the baron himself as has been stated already had no lack of manly beauty either in face or form while the loveliness of his bride appeared almost more than mortal even their splendid attire seemed to attract little notice when compared with their personal beauty after the surprise and admiration had somewhat abated the feast progressed more satisfactorily all were in high spirits and good humour and conviviality reigned throughout the hall even on the baron it seemed to produce a kindly effect so that few who could have seen him at that moment would have imagined him to be the stern cold-blooded tyrant he really was his countenance was lighted up with good humour and friendliness much as his attention was occupied with his bride he had still a little to bestow on his guests and he rose many times from his seat to request the attention of the servants to their wants at last he cast his eye over the tables as if searching for some person whom he could not see and he then beckoned to the major-domo who staff of office in hand advanced to receive his orders i do not see the esquires of the lady teresa in the room said the baron your excellency said the man they are not here how is that said the baron with some impatience you ought to have found room for them in the hall where are they your excellency said the major-domo who from the expression of the baron's countenance evidently expected a storm they are not here the whole of the suite left the castle immediately after the mules were unladen and her ladyship had left her room i was inspecting the places which i had prepared for them when a servant came forward and told me that the esquires and attendants had left the castle i at once hurried after them and begged they would return as i was sure your excellency would feel hurt if they did not stay to the banquet but they told me they had received express orders to leave the castle directly after they had seen the lady teresa lodged safely in it i again entreated them to stay but it was useless they hurried on their way and i returned by myself the ill-bred hounds said the baron in anger a sound scourging would have taught them better manners do not be angry with them said teresa laying her hand gently on that of her husband's they did but obey their master's orders some day i swear said the baron i will be revenged on their master for this insult miserable churl that he is he had no sooner uttered these words than he looked round him for the sparrow but the bird did not make its appearance possibly its absence alarmed him even more than its presence would have done for he began to dread lest the vengeance of the astrologer was about to fall on him without giving him the usual notice teresa perceiving the expression of his countenance did all in her power to calm him but for some time she but partially succeeded he continued to glance anxiously about him to ascertain if possible from which side the blow might come he was just on the point of raising a goblet to his lips when the idea seized him that the wine might be poisoned he declined to touch food for the same reason the idea of being struck with death when at the height of his happiness seemed to overwhelm him thanks however to the kind soothing of teresa as well as the absence of any visible effects of the anominato's anger he at last became completely reassured and the feast proceeded long before the banquet had concluded the baron and his wife quitted the hall and retired through their private apartments to the terrace of the castle the evening 
which was now rapidly advancing, was warm and genial, and not a cloud was to be seen in the atmosphere. For some time they walked together up and down on the terrace, and afterwards they seated themselves on a bench. There, with his arm round her waist, and her head leaning on his shoulder, they watched the sun in all his magnificence, sinking behind the mountains. The sun had almost disappeared when the baron took his wife's hand in his. "'How cold thou art, my dear,' he said to her. "'Let us go in.' Teresa made no answer, but rising from her seat was conducted by her husband into the room which opened on to the terrace, and which was lighted by a large brass lamp which hung by a chain from the ceiling. When they were nearly under the lamp, whose light increased as the daylight declined, Conrad again cast his arm round his wife, and fondly pressed her head to his breast. They remained thus for some moments, entranced in their happiness. "'Dost thou really love me, Teresa?' asked the baron. "'Love you?' said Teresa, now burying her face in his bosom. "'Love you? Yes, dearer than all the world. My very existence hangs on your life. When that ceases, my existence ends.' When she had uttered these words, Conrad, in a state of intense happiness, said to her, "'Kiss me, my beloved.' Teresa still kept her face pressed on his bosom, and Conrad, to overcome her coyness, placed his hand on her head and gently pressed it backwards so that he might kiss her. He stood motionless, aghast with horror, for the light of the lamp above their heads showed him no longer the angelic features of Teresa, but the hideous face of a corpse that had remained some time in the tomb and whose only sign of vitality was a horrible phosphoric light which shone in its eyes. Conrad now tried to rush from the room and to scream for assistance, but in vain. With one arm she clasped him tightly round the waist, and raising the other, she placed her clammy hand upon his mouth and threw him with great force upon the floor. Then, seizing the side of his neck with her lips, she deliberately and slowly sucked from him his life's blood, while he, utterly incapable either of moving or crying, was yet perfectly conscious of the awful fate that was awaiting him. In this manner Conrad remained for some hours in the arms of his vampire wife. At last faintness came over him, and he grew insensible. The sun had risen some hours before consciousness returned. He rose from the ground horror-stricken and pallid, and glanced fearfully around him to see if Teresa were still there, but he found himself alone in the room. For some minutes he remained undecided what step to take. At last he rose from his chair to leave the apartment, but he was so weak he could scarcely drag himself along. When he left the room he bent his steps towards the courtyard. Each person he met saluted him with the most profound respect, while on the countenance of each was visible an expression of intense surprise, so altered was he from the athletic young man they had seen him the day before. Presently he heard the merry laughter of a number of children, and immediately hastened to the spot from whence the noise came. To his surprise, he found his wife Teresa, in full possession of her beauty, playing with several children, whose mothers had brought them to see her, and who stood delighted with the condescending kindness of the baroness towards their little ones. Conrad remained motionless for some moments, gazing with intense surprise at his wife, and the idea occurred to him that the events of the last night must have been a terrible dream and nothing more. But he was at a loss how to account for his bodily weakness. Teresa, in the midst of her gambols with the children, accidentally raised her head and perceived her husband. She uttered a slight cry of pleasure when she saw him, and, 
snatching up in her arms a beautiful child she had been playing with she rushed towards him exclaiming look dear conrad what a little beauty this is is he not a little cherub the baron gazed wildly at his wife for a few moments but said nothing my dearest husband what ails you said teresa are you not well conrad made no answer but turning suddenly round staggered hurriedly away while teresa with an expression of alarm and anxiety on her face followed him with her eyes as he went he still hurried on till he reached the small sitting-room from which he was accustomed each morning to issue his orders to his dependents and seated himself in a chair to recover if possible from the bewilderment he was in presently ludovico whose duty it was to attend on his master every morning for instructions entered the room and bowing respectfully to the baron stood silently aside waiting till he should be spoken to but during the time marking the baron's altered appearance with the most intense curiosity after some moments the baron asked him what he saw to make him stare in that manner pardon my boldness your excellency said ludovico but i was afraid you might be ill i trust i am in error what should make you think i am unwell inquired the baron your highness's countenance is far paler than usual and there is a small wound on the side of your throat i hope you have not injured yourself the last remark of ludovico decided the baron that the events of the evening had been no hallucination what stronger proof could be required than the marks of his vampire wife's teeth still upon him he perceived that some course of action must be at once decided upon and the urgency of his position aided him to concentrate his thoughts he determined on visiting a celebrated anchorite who lived in the mountains about four leagues distant and who was famous not only for the piety of his life but for his power in exorcising evil spirits having come to this resolution he desired ludovico immediately to saddle for him a sure-footed mule as the path to the anchorite's dwelling was not only difficult but dangerous ludovico bowed and after having been informed that there were no other orders he left the room wondering in his mind what could be the reason for his master's wishing a mule saddled when he generally rode only the highest spirited horses the conclusion he came to was that the baron must have been attacked with some serious illness and was about to proceed to some skilful leech as soon as ludovico had left the room the baron called to one of the servants whom he saw passing and ordered breakfast to be brought to him immediately hoping that by a hearty meal he should recover sufficient strength for the journey he was about to undertake to a certain extent he succeeded though possibly it was from the quantity of wine he drank rather than from any other cause for he had no appetite and had eaten but little he now descended into the courtyard of the castle cautiously avoiding his wife finding the mule in readiness he mounted it and started on his journey for some time he went along quietly and slowly for he still felt weak and languid but as he attained a higher elevation of the mountains the cold breeze seemed to invigorate him he now began to consider how he could rid himself of the horrible vampire he had married and of whose real nature he had no longer any doubt speculations on this subject occupied him till he had entered on a narrow path on the slope of an exceedingly high mountain it was difficult to keep footing and it required all his caution to prevent himself from falling of fear however the baron had none and his thoughts continued to run on the possibility of separating himself from teresa and on what vengeance he would take on the innominato for the treachery he had practised on him as soon as he should be fairly freed the more he dwelt on his revenge the more excited he became till at last he exclaimed aloud infamous wretch let me be but once fairly released from the execrable fiend you have imposed upon me 
and i swear i will burn thee alive in thy castle as a fitting punishment for the sorcery thou hast practised conrad had hardly uttered these words when the pathway upon which he was riding gave way beneath him and glided down the incline into a tremendous precipice below he succeeded in throwing himself from his mule which with the debris of the rocks was hurried over the precipice while he clutched with the energy of despair at each object he saw likely to give him a moment's support but everything he touched gave way and he gradually sank and sank towards the verge of the precipice his efforts to save himself becoming more violent the nearer he approached to what appeared certain death down he sank till his legs actually hung over the precipice when he succeeded in grasping a stone somewhat firmer than the others thus retarding his fall for a moment in horror he now glanced at the terrible chasm beneath him when suddenly different objects came before his mind with fearful reality there was an unhappy peasant who had without permission killed a head of game hanging from the branch of a tree still struggling in the agonies of death while his wife and children were in vain imploring the baron's clemency this vanished and he saw a boy with a knife in his hand stabbing at his own mother for some slight offence she had given him this passed and he found himself in a small village the inhabitants of which were all dead within their houses for at the approach of winter he had in a fit of ill temper ordered his retainers to take from them all their provisions and a snowstorm coming on immediately afterwards they were blocked up in their dwellings and all perished again his thoughts reverted to the position he was in and his eye glanced over the terrible precipice that yawned beneath him when he saw as if in a dream the house of beefy the farmer with his wife and children around him apparently contented and happy as soon as he had realized the idea the stone which he had clutched began to give way and all seemed lost to him when a sparrow suddenly flew on the earth a short distance from him and immediately afterwards darted away save but my life screamed the baron and i swear i will keep all secret the words had hardly been uttered when a goatherd with a long staff in his hand appeared on the incline above him the man perceiving the imminent peril of the baron with great caution and yet with great activity descended to assist him he succeeded in reaching a ledge of rock a few feet above and rather to the side of the baron to whom he stretched forth the long mountain staff in his hand the baron clutched it with such energy as would certainly have drawn the goat herd over with him had it not been that the latter was a remarkably powerful man with some difficulty the baron reached the ledge of the rock and the goat herd then ascended to a higher position and in like manner drew the baron on till at last he had contrived to get him to a place of safety as soon as conrad found himself out of danger he gazed wildly around him for a moment then dizziness came over him and he sank fainting on the ground when the baron had recovered his senses he found himself so weak that it would have been impossible for him to have reached the castle that evening he therefore willingly accompanied the goatherd to his hut in the mountains where he proposed to pass the night the man made what provision he could for his illustrious guest and prepared him a supper of the best his hut afforded but had the latter been composed of the most exquisite delicacies it would have been equally tasteless for conrad had not the slightest appetite evening was now rapidly approaching and the goatherd prepared a bed of leaves over which he threw a cloak and the baron utterly exhausted reposed on it for the night without anything occurring to disturb his rest next morning he found himself somewhat refreshed by his night's rest and he prepared to return to the castle assisted by the goatherd to whom he had promised a handsome reward 
he had now given up all idea of visiting the anchorite dreading that by so doing he might excite the animosity of the anominato of whose tremendous power he had lately received more than ample proof in due time he reached home in safety and the goatherd was dismissed after having received the promised reward on entering the castle yard the baron found his wife in a state of great alarm and sorrow and surrounded by the retainers no sooner did she perceive her husband than uttering a cry of delight and surprise she rushed forward to clasp him in her arms but the baron pushed her rudely away and hurrying forwards directed his steps to the room in which he was accustomed to issue his orders ludovico having heard of the arrival of his master immediately waited on him ludovico said the baron as soon as he saw him i want you to execute an order for me with great promptitude and secrecy go below and prepare two good horses for a journey one for you the other for myself see that we take with us provisions and equipments for two or three days as soon as they are in readiness leave the castle with them without speaking to any one and wait for me about a league up the mountain where in less than two hours i will join you now see that you faithfully carry out my orders and if you do so i assure you you will lose nothing by your obedience ludovico left the baron's presence to execute his order when immediately afterwards a servant came into the room and inquired if the lady teresa might enter tell your mistress said the baron in a tone of great courtesy and kindness that i hope she will excuse me for the moment as i am deeply engaged in affairs of importance but i shall await her visit with great impatience in the afternoon the baron now left to himself began to draw out more fully the plan for his future operations he resolved to visit his brother hermann and consult him as to what steps he ought to take in this horrible emergency and in case no better means presented themselves he determined on offering to give up to hermann the castle of gerdenau and the whole valley of the engadine on condition of receiving from him an annuity sufficient to support him in the position he had always been accustomed to maintain he then intended to retire to some distant country where there would be no probability of his being followed by the horrible monster whom he had accepted as his wife of course he had no intention of receiving teresa in the afternoon and he had merely put off her visit for the purpose of allowing himself to escape with greater convenience from the castle about an hour after ludovico had left him the baron quitted the castle by a postern with as much haste as his enfeebled strength would allow and hurried after his retainer whom he found waiting him with the horses the baron immediately mounted one and followed by ludovico took the road to his brothers where in three days he arrived in safety hermann received his brother with great pleasure though much surprised at the alteration in his appearance my dear conrad he said to him what can possibly have occurred to you you look very pale weak and haggard have you been ill worse a thousand times worse said conrad let us go where we may be by ourselves and i will tell you all hermann led his brother into a private room where conrad explained to him the terrible misfortune which had befallen him hermann listened attentively and for some time could not help doubting whether his brother's mind was not affected but conrad explained everything in so circumstantial and lucid a manner as to dispel that idea to the proposition which conrad made to make over the territory of the engadine valley for an annuity hermann promised to give full consideration at the same time before any further steps were taken in the matter he advised conrad to visit a villa he had on the seashore about ten miles distant from genoa where in quiet and seclusion he would be able to recover his energies conrad thanked his brother for his advice and willingly accepted the offer two days afterwards he started on the journey 
and by the end of the week arrived safely and without difficulty at the villa on the evening of his arrival conrad who had employed himself during the afternoon in visiting the different apartments as well as the grounds surrounding the villa was seated at a window overlooking the sea the evening was deliciously calm and he felt such ease and security as he had not enjoyed for some time past the sun was sinking in the ocean and the moon began to appear and the stars one by one to shine in the cloudless heavens the thought crossed conrad's mind that the sight of the sun sinking in the waters strongly resembled his own position when he fell over the precipice the thought had hardly been conceived when someone touched him on the shoulder he turned round and saw standing before him in the full majesty of her beauty his wife teresa my dearest conrad she said with much affection in her tone why have you treated me in this cruel manner it was most unkind in you to leave me suddenly without giving the slightest hint of your intentions execrable fiend said conrad springing from his chair leave me why do you haunt me in this manner do not speak so harshly to me my dear husband said teresa to oblige you i was taken from my grave and on you now my very existence depends rather my death said conrad one night more such as we passed and i should be a corpse nay dear conrad said teresa i have the power of indefinitely prolonging your life drink but of this she continued taking from the table behind her a silver goblet and to-morrow all ill effects will have passed away conrad mechanically took the goblet from her hand and was on the point of raising it to his lips when he suddenly stopped and with a shudder replaced it again on the table it is blood he said true my dear husband said teresa what else could it be my life is dependent on your life's blood and when that ceases so does my life drink then i implore you she continued again offering him the goblet look the sun has already sunk beneath the wave a minute more and daylight will have gone drink conrad i implore you or this night will be your last conrad again took the goblet from her hand to raise it to his lips but it was impossible and he placed it on the table a ray of pure moonlight now penetrated the room as if to prove that the light of day had fled teresa again transformed into a horrible vampire flew at her husband and throwing him on the floor fastened her teeth on the half-healed wound in his throat the next morning when the servants entered the room they found the baron a corpse on the floor but teresa was nowhere to be seen nor was she ever heard of afterwards little more remains to be told hermann took possession of the castle of gerdinal and the valley of the engadine and treated his vassals with even more despotism than his brother had done before him at last driven to desperation they rose against him and slew him and the valley afterwards became absorbed into the canton of the grisson End of The Last Lords of Gerdinal First published in the Argosy in 1867 Thank you for listening.